Welcome to episode number two of Scary Fairy Godmother Live. Today with us, we have Dr. Simon Young. He's a historian of fairies and the supernatural. He's worked alongside the Fairy Investigation Society on a fairy census. And his latest book, Magical Folk, British and Irish Fairies, 500 AD to the Present, is available in bookstores and online. And there's a link in the description. Dr. Young, welcome to the channel, and thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. It's really great to have you. My first question for you is, how far back in time did the earliest stories about fairies start to get told? I mean, how, how far back does, do these beliefs go? Well, I, I think that the answer to that is they go back to the dawn of time. I mean, if you think of fair, fairies as being creatures that are believed to inhabit the world around us, particularly perhaps um, the, the landscape, natural places, places of power. Um, these are ideas that you can arguably trace back to prehistoric monuments. Um, I, I was recently sent an image um, by someone working on cave paintings from Africa um, suggesting to me that here there was actually a cave painting of what he believed was a fairy from several thousand years BC. So this is something that's been there in all of human history. The idea that in the world around us, particularly in the natural world, there are spirits. Um, and in recent times, in the last, what, 500 years in English, we've referred to these spirits as fairies. But if we actually think, if we go beyond the name and think of the idea, that idea has always been there in history. And when you come across legends from the, the Greeks and Romans, for example, um, about fauns or dryads, this is the same idea, the idea that there are natural spirits around us. Those, the, the ideas from Greek, Greece and Rome about the naiads and dryads, did that sort of evolve to become the fairies that we understand today? Um, pe people get very excited about this question. And there are some, I, there are some people who suggest that actually our fairies did indeed evolve from these Greek and Roman ideas. Um, I, I personally am very, very sceptical about this. I, I think that every society in the world had their local spirits. These are just the Greek and Roman examples of this. Um, and for example, if you go back to um, Roman British times, um, Romano Britain had, um, there were little clues in the archaeological record that the Britons the local Britons had their own fairies long before the Romans actually came to the island and continued to be fascinated by these fairies after the Romans were here. Uh, there's a very, very good book that's just come out um, by a man who I, I should hasten to add is no relative of mine. In fact, he disagrees with me quite a lot in the book. His name is Francis Young, <laughs> and the book is called Sussex Fairy Law. Um, and it's about one British county and Francis looks at references to fairies through history. And he begins back 2000 years ago in Romano British times with a, a series of um, special magical ritual objects that have been found. And these ritual objects seem to have the names of local fairies written on them. Oh, wow. Well, uh, that's fascinating. What's the name of the book again? I can put it in the description for anybody who's interested. Right. So it's, it's Sussex Fairy Law. Sussex um, Fairy Law. I mean, it really did come out about two weeks ago. I mean, it came out at the very beginning of December for the Christmas market. Sussex is an English county uh, just to the south of London. Um, and I'm sorry, I've messed up. It's not Sussex Fairy Law. It's Suffolk Fairy Law. Suffolk, Suffolk Fairy Law. Fairy Law. Okay. Suffolk is a county just to the east of London. Okay. Uh, you've got to remember that here it's 10 o'clock at night, so I'm a little bit sleepier oh, okay. uh, than lots of your public listening. Oh, and I should say, um, Dr. Young has mentioned he's got a bit of a cold, so excuse any uh, coughing or anything like that. And it, yeah. we're live, so, you know, you never know what's going to happen. That's um, right. <laughs> um, I'm interested in how people used to describe fairies, you know, as, as far back into the past that we have accounts. What were their descriptions of fairies physically um, from those days? And uh, what kind of stories did they used to tell about them? 
Well, um, I, I'll give you one example, which always, I think, really hits people between the eyes when I when I explain this. Um, if you get today a class of 20 or 30 children and you say to them, as one of my colleagues did, everyone draw a fairy, 29 of the 30 children will draw a picture of a small humanoid with wings. And yet this idea of fairy wings is very, very recent in history. Um, it's difficult to go much further back than about 200 years um, with the idea that fairies had wings. And if you talk to someone saying Shakespeare's time, remember that uh, Shakespeare himself includes fairies in three of his plays. Mm -hmm. um, no one had this idea that fairies had wings. Wings were something that only angels had. And I think that when you look back at the images of fairies through the centuries, the one thing where there is a kind of constancy where we get repeated references to this is the idea that fairies are, are relatively small. But that doesn't mean, as we often think today, necessarily butterfly small or, say, the size of an owl. Um, the, lots of traditional references particularly from britain and ireland um have fairies which is say the size of a 10 year old child or a 12 year old child um mm -hmm. and it has to be said there are also references where fairies are identical in appearance to normal human beings yeah i've read quite a few accounts where uh the fairies you know appear almost identically to humans except maybe there's um some sort of detail that's kind of off, you know, yeah. like they'll have a, this, uh, there's some hint that they're not quite uh, human. And, and I've been some of the stories that some of my subscribers here have shared with me have have told of, of fairies like this. So th these are even in modern uh, people's modern encounters, we have encounters of life sized human sized fairies. Yeah, there's absolutely, you're absolutely right. There's no question about this. Um, and one of the great 19th century fairy writers, um, the Irish poet W.B. Yeats, has a lovely sentence where um, he says, you know, fairies can be whatever size they want to be. Yeah. Um, and and this, is, this is certainly true in the descriptions we have of people meeting fairies. Um, and indeed, I would say that idea that fairies are human size is particularly common from Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the 19th century, that's where you get the most reference references to human size fairies. Um, and you were also saying in recent times, fairies are often seen uh, as normal size. Y you mentioned at the very beginning um, that I've been involved in the fairy census. There was this collection of 500 different sightings mm -hmm. of fairies in modern times. And it's certainly interesting there that there are lots of descriptions of people coming face to face with beings or entities that they described as being about their size. But then there are also lots of descriptions of people having encounters with entities that are actually really quite small. Yeah, well, I definitely, uh, you know, people submit me a lot of stories like that as well. But what I'm mm. interested in what were fairies understood to be historically like what are fairies you know what do people believe that they are and how has that changed um well I, I think the first thing to say the first part of the question is that there was this idea that fairies were uh, a phrase that you will know well was scary um th mm -hmm. there was this idea that fairies were not all sweetness and light that they they had to be taken very seriously that they could cause damage, that they could hurt human beings. Um, and there was also this idea that fairies could also help human beings. So they, they weren't demons. They weren't, they weren't creatures that were unambiguously bad. But there was this sense that they, they could be good or bad depending on their moods, depending on their own private rules. Uh, and one of the slightly alarming things about fairies um, in traditional accounts is that you you often get this sense that for for people living in in farms um, in small communities dotted around the countryside the fairies rules were very very strict the fairies had a series of rules that humans were expected to follow and if they didn't things could get very serious uh, very quickly um, and I, I mean, the example I, I'm deliberately giving you here shocking examples, sure. uh, but it, it, in 19th century Ireland, um, we have lots of references 
to to children being killed because a family had had um, not respected fairy laws. For example, if you lived in Ireland in 1870. Um, dotted around the countryside still today there are what were called fairy forts and on those fairy forts very often thorns grew and those thorns were believed to be the special property of fairies and you know god forbid that you should chop down one of these thorns because if that happened your five or six children would be killed um i mean they would die one by one um and so i think that that's just a reminder that people who used to come into contact with fairies had not just respect for fairies but really a very great fear for fairies yeah i i've also read about um people you know sort of lining up their front door and their their back door so fairy processions can can go through <laughs> is that something that's familiar to you i don't, I don't know yeah, what I mean, like. we, we get hints of this from britain but the place you find it most of all is ireland mm -hmm. um, and there there is the idea that the fairies have special roads and these roads are typically straight and they line up between different places where fairy groups, we could almost say fairy tribes are supposed to live. Because another of the important things in Irish folklore, but we, we get quite a lot of this in British folklore too, is that the fairies are constantly fighting each other. There's a kind of a Game of Thrones thing going on there between the different factions of fairies. And when you built a house in the Irish countryside in the 19th century, it was very important to be sure that you didn't accidentally build on a fairy roof, uh, excuse me, a fairy route, mm -hmm. because that was a sure way to annoy the fairies. Um, and there is, I don't know if you've ever come across this, but it's, it's worth you and, and perhaps your listeners uh, looking out for this. There's a lovely photograph, um, and I, I think it's in McManus's um, book on the fairies, um, where you, there's a 19th century Irish house that's missing a corner because the family had a series of tragedies in the family. The local, let's say, fairy doctor, this was the 19th century Irish term for people who could talk and interact with fairies, told them that they'd accidentally built the house on a fairy track um, and at this point they removed the corner of a house so the fairies could have free access and at that point the run of bad luck that the family had been having ceased wow and what's the name of the book again i'll put i'll also i'll put any books that are mentioned in the stream in the description for <laughs> anyone's interested in those books and wants to pick them up uh they right. can do so so yeah, th this is one of the very best um, fairy books from the 20th century. Um, and it's, um, I, I've made the mistake, this is typical amateur hour on my part, I've made the oh. mistake of standing up and pulling out um, my um, speaker. That's all right, live live broadcast, anything can happen. Um, this <laughs> is, it's a book um, by Damien McManus. Damien McManus. Um, it's called... Um, Oh, you know, I'm going to walk across the room and just have a look. This you know is what? the price. That's all right. We can we can put of having a cold. We can do it after the after the stream. Like, okay. I'll, what I'll do is any books that are mentioned, I'll go and look over them, and then in the end, I'll do a list below. Anyway, it's Damien McManus, and it, it really is a fabulous book. It's called The Middle Kingdom. The Middle oh, Kingdom. The Middle Kingdom. That's great. Is that where? Um, I and I think that your your listeners would particularly enjoy this. Because it's just so full of um, fairy experiences. You know, it's not just folklorists talking about fairy th theory. It's people actually describing lived experiences. Yeah, and that's definitely what my channel is all about. So, yeah. so yeah, that's the right audience for that. Mm. Um, I'm interested in what sort of places specifically you know fairies are associated with I, I, you know i know that they're associated with nature you know the the farm and that kind of thing but also are there places that you found through the fairy census for example where there are particular hot spots or hubs of fairy activities where you get more people reporting experiences than others that side, sort of thing um yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I, one thing I'd start by saying is you, you, you started off with this interesting comment that 
fairies are particularly associated with natural places and i said something similar before but even that you could mess you could play around with as an idea i think fairies are particularly associated with places which isn't necessarily quite the same thing and we do for example in british and irish tradition again in both countries have this idea that some kinds of fairies and remember there are different kinds um, are particularly associated with actual human habitations. Mm -hmm. uh, Britain, for example, has a type of fairy called the hob. Um, and the hob or hob um, was particularly, it was believed to live in or near certain houses. And this fairy would become, they were they always lived on their own, but they were fairies who had a relationship with the, with the human family and they would help the family or sometimes they would become angry with the family. And then, like you say, there are also places in the countryside, uh, particularly associated with fairies. Um, and I, I think that these are places that I, I always think of them as being charismatic places. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they're a lake. Sometimes they're a hill. Um, sometimes they're um, a, a wood. Um, but for one reason or another, the local community has come to believe that these places are special. Many years ago, I was in Ireland and I, I was with um, an Irish woman and an Italian friend. and We were driving through the countryside um, and uh, this woman s s suddenly said to I and my Italian friend, um, you know, this is a place here. And she pointed to a crossroads. She said, I've never seen a fairy, but I've always thought that if... I was to see a fa fairy, it would be here. And clearly in this woman's mind, driving backwards and forwards to Dublin every day, this place registered in some way as being a powerful place. And this is something that I, I particularly find just fascinating. Why is it certain places? I, I live in the, the Italian hills in the, the Apennines, um, a very wild countryside roundabout. Why is it that some places that I walk through have this just a sense of they they have a kind of a feel to them that's a little bit weird and and for this you do not need to believe or not believe in fairies because this feeling is something which you know which is there i mean for example i walk with my dog and i'm i'm always struck that my dog at certain points becomes a little bit wary there are places that for whatever reasons buzz very strongly on on our internal radar I think a lot of us have had that kind of experience, you know, even those who, who haven't had any kind of fairy or supernatural experience where you're walking in a forest or something like that and you just feel like there's a certain magic present, you know, like you are watching the trees and the trees are sort of watching you. <laughs> yeah. it's, it, I, I've never understood. I, I, I guess I'm a very kind of nuts and bolts person and I, I'd love to have someone really explain this to me, but I, I've never really understood why certain places have this feel, but yet, you know, it might have to do with just something as simple as their angle to sunlight, mm -hmm. um, you know the the fact that you can see them from certain angles the change in the light as you're walking through them uh, maybe micro differences in temperature i mean i'm being very overly rational here but i think what we can what we can all agree on and this is something that everyone can agree on all the way from fairy believers all the way through to people who are ardent materialists um, and you know do not see any other dimensions in life is that these places exist and we'd explain them in different ways but this probably goes back to our experience as hunter gatherers thousands and thousands of years ago there are these places that just light up in our heads um, and that we get to know. Um, at the moment, I'm doing another project about the supernatural that isn't primarily about fairies. But one of the exciting bits about this project is I've taken um, 11 different English villages from the 19th century where people have written um, very good descriptions of local supernatural forces. And what I've done is I've got the maps of the 19th century and put these forces onto the map. And it's fascinating to see the way that in the 19th century, if you lived in the countryside, any village would have anything between a half dozen and a dozen of these places that had a reputation. And sometimes the reputation was because of a ghost, sometimes because of a fairy. But it was known that these places were special.
they're they're like sort of hot spots as I, as hot i was spots. saying yeah and yeah, and i mean yeah. it doesn't just happen out in nature as you mentioned you know like sometimes it's an old church or an old castle or even an inn you know that i mean but absolutely and of course the, the equivalent for for human places is, is what we think of as spooky rooms or rooms that just feel a little bit strange um i mean if you have a, a building that's big enough be it a monastery a castle maybe even a big pub in the uk um it, it's it, it's very often the idea that, that there's a room that has a reputation and i think it's exactly the same thing I'm struck by how similar the fairies tend to be to us. Uh, they, you know, they aren't angels, they aren't demons. You, when you think of the sort of panoply of different supernatural beings, um, they're they're morally ambiguous, um, and yet they aren't like us. And sometimes in a story, you know, as I was saying before, you'll, that someone will meet. A fairy and at first they'll think that this fairy is a human and then there would be some kind of weird detail that will give them away um what what is, is this part of the reason that some of us find them so fascinating because they are so similar to us you were saying about how you, you know we there there are these series that they have this kind of game of thrones uh uh conflict going on between each other that there's this sort of whole world that um, we're missing out on, you know, that, that is similar <laughs> to ours and yet so different. Um, I think there yeah, was I, in there, but <laughs> no, I, I think there was, um, let, let's say this, that, um, I, I always think of fairies as being a mirror to human society that they're, they're a version of us, but they're not quite us. Uh, but it's very striking that if, and here Ireland is probably the best example again, just because our sources are so good. But when you read what those who believe in fairies thought about them in the 19th century in Ireland, fairies did everything that humans did. Um, they got married, they had funerals, um, there were there were various um, beliefs. They had battles. They went hunting. They were a kind of a parallel society um, to our own. And yeah, th this is. Th I think this is something which is, at least for me, yeah, one of the reasons that fairies are so attractive. And and just let me compare this to another supernatural force, which are ghosts. I mean, when we have images of ghosts um, in our society, usually there's an idea that you know one of these spirits is on a kind of a loop that it's walking up and down the same corridor um that it's it's somehow it's a very two-dimensional personality mm -hmm. whereas when you get to the world of fairies you 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 encounter very rich personalities like our own very three-dimensional personalities um and so i think in that way fairies um particularly for storytellers perhaps if you tell a story about a ghost, in a sense, the most important part of that story is the human reaction, because the ghost itself often is a fairly flat character. Um, whereas if you're looking at fairies, fairies in stories often become real protagonists. Uh, they're very, very exciting in that way. They have a lot more potential. Mm hmm. Yeah, I mean, th that's something that I've always found so fascinating about them, that they're, they're so varied. They're like this motley crew of different beings of different sizes. And, and you just have this sense that there is this whole other world going on that we're sort of missing out on. And I mean, I think that kind of leads into my next question, which is, what can you tell me about fairy itself, by which I mean the place, you, you know, the sort of between world or middle middle world or middle earth, I guess, <laughs> as Tolkien would say. Um, yeah. It's sort of between between our world and, I don't know, maybe the afterlife. And it seems to have from certain stories almost a different a different place in time you know like somebody will spend a day in the fairy world or a night of feasting and find that you know 100 years have passed in the real world so uh, what's going on there and and what what were the beliefs about this other place well um I, I think that the first thing to say about this place is that really we know very very little about it and and it's it's set up as a place that's so magical in a sense and maybe you could compare this to 
Christian views of paradise, that it's so magical that in a sense, we, we're not really allowed to do anything more than glimpse it. And when in fairy stories, you have people who visit fairy, um, usually the, the details um, are very short, um, very, um, very nebulous, I suppose. Um, they're a little bit clouded. Um, typically, when we have references, it's references to a feast or to some kind of banquet, a party, um, something along these lines. Yeah, I mean, there's, there is. There's this idea of of glamour, of the fairy glamour that I've read about, where you know they'll they'll find themselves in an exquisite hall, and there's goblets and a feast, and then they'll wake up and find that they're in a dank cave and things that they thought were uh, you know, beautiful food or are like sort of <laughs> leaves or dead leaves or twigs or whatever it is, yeah. that, that there's an illusion happening. I mean, you, you will have come across this and I'm sure many of your listeners will too, but there's that lovely idea that the, the King of Fairy gives some golden coins um, and the person walks away with these golden coins, opens the, the purse uh, and in the light of day, they're just dead leaves. And I, I think that, that we're back to the mirror, that this is a mirror of our own society. Um, and yet the things within it, yeah, that never quite have the same realities we would expect. Um, it, it's One thing I've always found fascinating is when you go back to the Middle Ages, and we do actually have one late medieval poem from Scotland that says this. Um, it says that there's, and you referred to this briefly before, that, that as, as as medieval Christians, there's this road that leads to heaven. There's a road that leads to hell, but there's also a road that leads to this third place, which is fairy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that, that's a beautiful image. Yeah, I, th I, I think that that is a beautiful. And I, I have a feeling that a lot of my listeners might want to be on, on that third road. At the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but that's that's interesting. How did the fairies fit into early Christian understanding of the world? You know, like were they understood by the Christians to be totally malevolent, like sort of allied with demons or seen as sort of a, a another version of a demon? Um, right. And I know I, that they sort of turned up in some of the the, the witch trial stories, where witches yes, right. would. Uh, I think this was in the maybe the 1500s, where witches would say. Uh, they had, you know, sort of a fairy, almost as a familiar, helping them, uh, you know, when they were interrogated, they confessed these these relationships with fairies. Um, what can you tell us about that? Well, um, I think that the, the simple answer is this, that Christianity has always been um, a little bit like Judaism before it, a fairly... Um, how can we how can we put this politely? I mean, it's not been a religion that's had much tolerance for ideas outside its own very simple binary model yeah. of God and the devil. And it's it's one of these things where um, you know to quote a, a, a gospel line: "You're with us or against us." Mm -hmm. And so fairies were never going to get um, a good press or a good hearing. Um, and in that sense, I mean, that's 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 something there. Like you say, in the Scottish witch trials from the 1500s, I think the very late 1500s and above all the 1600s, um, fairies are cast as demons. Um, and even in in, let's say, non-Christian, I don't want to say non-Christian folklore, but the folklore of the people in general who were not necessarily, um, you know, avid churchgoers, um, fairies um, uh, are shown not, not as demons, but as half demons. Um, I'm sure that you and again, your listeners will have come across a story that we have from Ireland, but we also have an earlier reference to it in Britain. Uh, the idea that where did fairies come from? Well, when Lucifer was thrown out of heaven he fell down with his angels to hell but there was some fair there were some angels who were bad but not that bad they didn't deserve to go to hell and they were thrown into the ocean and onto the land and these became the fairies um and so that idea that fairies are a little bit diabolical has always been there is that why you have you know some fairies more associated with 
the water, you know, the mermaids and that sort of thing. Or... Uh, 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 yeah, this is a fascinating question. It's one that I've been really worried about recently. Oh. Um, it, it was, sorry, worried about. It's not quite keeping me up late at night. But <laughs> it's the, the reason I say this is that in the in the late 1500s and in the 1600s, there's um, a German writer, I, I should say a German speaking writer. <coughs> called Paracelsus mm -hmm. and he says that there are four kinds of fairies and this idea survives through to the modern day he says that there are four kinds of fairies four types for the four different elements so there are fairies of water and he calls them undines but we could easily call them mermaids um, there are salamanders who dwell in the fire there are gnomes that dwell on the earth <coughs> And there are what he calls sylphs, which are the fairies of the air. Um, and I, I, this is a very important moment in how we think about fairies when Paracelsus writes, because he's basically divvying up the fairies. And yet there are hints already before that, that people believe that there were different kinds of fairies. And one thing you often get, um, particularly in British fairy lore, is the idea that there were different coloured fairies. Oh, you you mean you mean like uh, different different colors that represent certain? Yeah, I mean, for example, in Shakespeare, there's a line where he says there are red fairies, there are green fairies, there are black fairies. Um, there's an extraordinary case from the 1500s from Dorset, which is um, southwestern England, a county in southwestern England, where um, a man finds himself on trial for witchcraft. And he describes how he goes out at night to the fairy hill to talk to the different kinds of fairies. And he says there are three different kinds of fairies and he names the different colours fairies. And in fact, he says the black fairies are worst. Are the okay. <laughs> well, and I think, you know, and fairies have, have also been, this is more recent though, associated with sort of different seasons or and and there's a sort of i think this is scottish the seely and unseely yeah, uh yeah. which is sort of is sort of a you know the holy and unholy i think is, is yeah um I mean, so there's always been this idea, but it, it, even to it, let's say within folk Christianity that, yeah, there are fairies that are beyond the pale, if you like, that are simply diabolical. But then perhaps I think the mainstream of fairies, there is this idea that, <coughs> again, that they're very, um, that they can be both good and bad. Um, that Going back to what you said before, that they're supposed to be really quite like us. Mm -hmm. um, like us, they're capable of incredible goodness, but also of also great evil. And I think this just goes to the fact, and actually we, we got a comment on, on the chat um, with Jenea War Warren, who's wondering um, how many different types of fairies there are. And I think um, this is something that, you know, there is no real answer to because I think like us, you know, it's very difficult to classify the fairies. It, it sounds like people have tried over the years, but. No, people have tried a lot. And I mean, I, I talked to you about Paracelsus saying there are four types of fairies. Um, I mean, if you go a wonderful book um, published in the late 1970s, Catherine Briggs, who is a British folklorist and fairyist, wrote this lovely, lovely book called The Fairy Dictionary. And if you open this, there are tens of fairies living in Britain and Ireland, according to Catherine Briggs, with all these names. Um, and so, yeah, there are lots of different attempts to classify fairies. Mm -hmm. What I would say is someone who spent years reading folklore, um, I, I've, I've always... I think you can easily get distracted by this and you can start thinking of fairies as types of birds that can be broken down into robins, blackbirds, hummingbirds and so on. And I think in the end, at least when you read folklore, that's probably a mistake um, because there are two main categories of fairies that come through folklore, at least from Britain and Ireland. There are the what we would think of as normal fairies. These are fairies who live in groups. <coughs> And then there are fairies who live um, in 
um, who live on their own, and they're often called by folklorists, in fact, solitary fairies. Mm-hmm. Um, and for example, you would put trolls into this category. Um, you would put hobs into this category. Um, and so that's that would be if someone says to me how many different types of fairies are there, I try and keep things simple and just say there are two. There are two main types, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I've noticed that you know mostly in the Victorian era, fairies they they took on sort of a more benevol- bene- benevolent tone, um, and they they sort of shrank and and they became the fairies that I guess we know today with the wings and. Um, they became more associated with children. But as, as everybody who follows my channel knows, I, I've focused more on the, on the scary side of them. Yes, yeah. But uh, how, how did this change come about? You know, and, and when did they, they start to kind of get almost d- demoted? Because, mm-hmm. you know, when we were talking before about the, the Christian beliefs, um, sorry, this is going to be a second question, but even the the pagans or the Celts of that period, they they also feared the fairies, but I, I guess for different reasons. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, by the time you get to, uh, I mean, there's, uh, I mean, a very good example of this is in 1895. There's um, a famous um, fairy event in Ireland where a family in Tipperary come to believe that a young woman in the family named Bridget is a fairy, that she's been changed by the fairies. Um, And after a series of ceremonies, the husband of Bridget, a man named Michael O'Cleary, actually burns his wife to death. Mm -hmm. Um, And yet at the same time, just a couple of hundred miles away in Dublin, people were buying books where fairies were these tiny winged butterflies buzzing around children's heads. And so you really, I was just going to say, I remember there was a, I I know that story about Michael, Michael Clary, Clary, is it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember there's a little poem. It's like, are That's you? That's right. Yes, yeah. Are you a ghost? Or, sorry, I think it's, are you a witch or are you a fairy or are you the wife of Michael Clary? Claire, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it, it's a it's a tragic story, but you can imagine that th- these people must have been to actually to actually murder someone over this. They must have really sincerely. Yeah. No. Absolutely. No. I've I've no no doubt that it was. I mean, you can look, there were lots of nuances in that case, but always the most fascinating, the most tragic part of it is that Michael O'Cleary, the day after he'd murdered his wife, went out at night to the fairy fort because he believed that by murdering what he thought was a fairy, his wife would actually be released from the fairy fort. Um, He he believed he he brought her back in some way. Well, that's actually very tragic, you know. And- no, 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 that's a. I mean, it's a, it's a, a very sad case. Um, and I mean, what, you were saying, where does this, where does the idea of the fairies that you would have found in contemporary Dublin come from? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the fairies buzzing around children, the fairies, um, the sugar plum plum fairy, if you like, the winged fairy, and a, a couple of. Well, this summer I finished writing a study on the way that fairies' wings have developed through history. And I think that this gives you as strong a clue as any to this. And the bottom line is this, that traditional fairies in Britain and Ireland were of the scary type, or at least potentially scary. And it actually starts to change. (coughs) It starts to change in around about the late 1700s and it starts to change in art it's artists who lead this change they start to they start to paint fairies and in painting fairies they have to decide in a very concrete way what fairies look like and it's in right, that because period, before then you know you never would have had depictions of them right only descriptions i mean that's right if you asked someone in 1600 what does an angel look like? That person would have given you a very, very concrete answer, starting with human size, white with wings. Um, Because remember, there were stained glass windows with angels. There were pictures of them, but they just weren't of fairies. And so these artists who were creating fairies in the late 1700s, they weren't quite starting from scratch, but they they had to... (coughs) 
very concretely decide how to actually paint these fairies. And some of them, over a period of 40 or 50 years, began to experiment with using wings. Mm -hmm. And when they were starting out, it, I mean, it sounds simple to us, but they didn't know what kind of wings to use. So some used probably what would be normal in fairy pictures today, butterfly wings, but some used bird wings and some used bat wings oh, wow. so you know, they, they were really messing around with different ideas and that idea by the mid 1800s has gone mainstream and it's interesting that it's i think it's in the 1840s that you get the first children's stories where fairies are described as having wings <coughs> so this is an idea that starts to follow through yeah and and they sort of take a, a lighter more childlike turn i guess that's and right it, and maybe did, did it have anything to do with the sort of changing ideas that people had about children in childhood as well um yeah I, I i think that that's i think that I suspect that it would. Fairies were definitely infantilized. They became a thing of a children's world. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that's certainly true. Um, and the Victorian period is a period where um, the role of children in the house, I mean, children start to be separated out. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think I think that that's credible. Quite how you would match the two things step by step i'm not sure yeah i'm just gonna check the live chat um if you guys have any questions definitely put them in the chat and i'm gonna take a look uh we've got a question from trent muncher muncher sorry if i said that wrong he would like to know if we could talk about the lore of the fairy ring right well um the lore of the fairy ring i cannot think off the top of my head of any folklore about fairy rings from britain or ireland now i'm saying this slowly because i'm racking my brains for something um oh, right i mean, I mean I, when I, you I, have descriptions of fairies you have you have descriptions of fairies often being bejeweled mm -hmm. so in other words there is the idea that they have objects on them or about them which could include rings but i can't think <coughs> I think there were some continental stories by continental. I mean, French, German, perhaps particularly German. I seem to remember in the Brothers Grimm, there's a story about a fairy with three rings, uh, but I can't remember the details of that. So sorry. Oh, that's OK. I, I mean, I, I think uh, some fairy ring stories have shown up on my channel from time to time, you know, where someone will find a a circle of of uh, toadstools or my oh, sorry look th this is probably again my my cough distracting me if you're talking about fairy rings in terms of a, a circle of fungi or mushrooms um that's something that goes all the way back i mean i think our first reference for the uk is from the 1500s and so it's an idea that's presumably much much older uh, yeah, I mean, I, I always find that, I mean, because I think many of us have, have come across those sort of rings or or a weird patch of grass that is slightly yeah. you know, different color than the other grass. And is, you know, and I think, you know, there may be some scientific explanations for these things, but they definitely stir the imagination. And there's always been this tradition of fairies associated with those phenomena. Yeah, and I, I think, again, there's, there's a, a second part to that, which I, I I find a little bit, I've never quite got my head around, but fairies are frequently described, and this is something which is true of all generations. It's true of modern fairy sightings, it's true of medieval fairy sightings, but fairies are often described, not just dancing, but dancing in circles. In other words, that you'll have six or seven fairies dancing around in a circle. Um, and that it almost certainly has something to do with the British, but above all the Irish and Scottish idea that fairies travel in whirlwinds. Mm. There's this strange idea about fairies being, um, let's say, circular forces. Um, and there's one account that I'm very, very fond of from Cornwall. Um, from the late 19th century of a little girl who goes with her sister to a well and they don't know anything about fairies. They've been brought up in a community where fairies aren't discussed. <laughs> but they see there 
um, a series of these beautiful women dancing around in a circle. Um, mm-hmm. And and that that's typical of many, many sightings, the idea that we see fairies dancing in these circles. And it's like they could have left this sort of trace behind this. Yeah, yeah this is the idea. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and like you say, it's not just mushrooms. That I, I think Shakespeare has the line about sour rings that the sheep will not um, chew on. Um, and so it can just be a discoloration within the grass as well. Mm-hmm. Avril from the chat would like to know more about the wild hunt. Ah, uh, Well, the wild hunt. This is one of these things which is a little bit within the world of fairy and a little bit outside um, from throughout Europe. Um, and I suspect that if we looked at this very, very broadly, we'd find it was from throughout Asia and Europe uh, and perhaps parts of Africa. There is this idea that from time to time, an army crosses the sky led by some figure, usually a diabolical figure. Um, and, our earliest reference for this from Britain comes in the 12th century where some monks had seen um, a hunt full of devilish spirits and black dogs. You can imagine this kind of thing uh, traveling through the woods and then into the sky. Now in some countries, the wild hunt is, 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 is to do with yes, really devilish diabolical forces. (laughs) But in some countries, and again, the two best examples are Scotland and Ireland, Mm -hmm. um, these wild hunts are often fairy hunts. They're the local fairy populations. Um, And this is something that you you often get in folklore, that you have the same thing in different countries, but different different mythical characters taking up the role. So in one country, it's the devil. In the other country, it's King Arthur. And in another country, it's the fairies. It (laughs) it all depends where you are. Yeah, that's quite a contrast between the devil and King Arthur. (laughs) Yeah, no, but but this... And yet, when you look at the underlying form and the stories about it, they tend to be almost identical. Yeah, and King Arthur, that whole the the Arthurian legend, there there was a relationship with fairies there with uh, Morgan Le Fay and the... no, no, abs- no, but no question about this. There's um, fairy lore is very, very strong in the Arthurian in the Arthurian cycles, and it, to some extent, our best early sources for fairies from the middle ages are actually Arthurian stories. Um, I mean, one story that all of your listeners will know is Gawain and the green Knight. Mm. And uh, I mean, people have different opinions on this, but I, I would put, you know, I bet my car uh, Gawain is uh, sorry, not Gawain. The green Knight is a fairy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gawain travels across this magical landscape to, to duel with a fairy. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 I love the Arthurian legend um, and all of that, and 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 the sort of fairy feel to it. I don't know if that's why I'm personally drawn to that story, but it 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 just seemed like. I mean, I guess it, it almost took place in in a kind of magical England of the past, you know, and and that's the way that I think of the fairy world. You know, is it's something. It's like a magical uh, second dimension almost right next to our own. Um, I've got another question here from Julian Snape. Um, he's wondering if tales of modern day UFO abductions have their roots in fairy abductions. Um, I, I, I think there has to be a relationship um, between these. Um I mean, let's let's just set out the the information here. Um, I mean, first of all, there is we haven't really talked about this, so it's worth underlining it. Mm-hmm. There is a strong idea in fairy law that fairies steal human beings and that they replace them with fake human beings. So, in some ways, fairies are interfering with human beings, um, and this is particularly true of. Um, of children um there's the idea that fairies come um especially at night <coughs> and they can steal children the, ch- and so if, the changeling story is the, interesting. the whole changeling story and of course when you think of modern alien stories um that you know it's it's very similar the idea 
particularly the whole part of ufology which says <laughs> that aliens come into our house they come into our bedrooms this is something that you get again and again in fairy descriptions right and they, in some, they 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 interfere with us and there's also another strand of fairy legends where fairies actually have sexual relations with human beings mm -hmm. while human beings are in bed um and that is also something that you get in what we could call alien law so i i think that this is absolutely true and to be fair people have been writing about this in different ways for the last um say 30 or 40 years mm -hmm. yeah um, and, and there's that whole concept of like you know the nightmare and and uh, people having sleep paralysis and and then and they'll have these experiences and some of them they'll describe more as fairies and others in modern times it, it'll be aliens and i don't know if that just sort of changed with our our um awareness of space and and you know going to the moon and everything i mean i i, I would the thing I always think of, I, I, I don't know much about UFOs. And in the same way, I find fairies extremely attractive. I, I, I just never really, I, I guess I don't like UFOs. I think that's the bottom line without miss, wishing to offend people who do. But I think that if you're looking um, at... I'm the same way, I, actually. I, I much prefer fairy stories and fairy encounter stories to alien encounter stories. Yeah, yeah I, so we're, we're absolutely on the same page with this. Yeah. Um, but I think that when you look at the... I, I think something happens. I think the most significant thing that happens as far as the change between fairies and aliens is human beings learn to fly. And I think from that moment, a hundred odd years ago, what happens is we start to look upwards. We start to look upwards. Um, and we, we're seeing more and more supernatural forces. And I'd interpret UFOs as basically being the modern supernatural in the sky. And there's just a growth for more and more interest in these forces. And mm -hmm. so I, 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 as far as I'm concerned, my suspicion is that they're one and the same thing. Yeah, I, I think that that's probably, there's probably some truth to that. And it's just that, you know, we're seeing it through a different lens. We're interpreting yes, yeah, it differently. Different lens. Yeah. Um, I, I, this is sort of changing a little the track a little bit, but it's something that I've been interested in. What can you tell me about the concept of elf shot? You know, where where someone will get like uh, they'll feel like they were hit by something. And yeah. well, there is this idea that um, fairies, um, that w one of the ways that they can punish human beings who contravene their laws is to shoot them. Um, and we have lots of references to this um, from Britain, from Scotland, from Ireland. But it's also interesting. It's one of the, the parts of fairy law which crossed. Um, from Britain, Ireland, and mainland Europe um, to the Americas. Um, and so there were also references from the Ozaks, from Nova Scotia, from Newfoundland, mm -hmm. to the idea that fairies can shoot people. And very often, the, the origins of these legends seem to have been small flint arrowheads um, that you know date back to Neolithic or even Paleolithic times that were prepared by earlier generations of humans. And these these arrowheads are tiny, and they were often interpreted as being um, as being shot by the fairies. So, for example, if you were in your field and you stumbled on one of these, as statistically every so often you would, then, and if it, then that's you right. You might assume that this had been shot by the invisible hands, you know, waiting behind that, that, the tree. That's, <laughs> that's it. And it's not it's not just a human thing. The reason I said a field is because it's the kind of thing if your cows started dying and you found one of these, you'd think, Oh my god, you know, the fairies have it in for us. And yeah. at this point we've got to we've got to find some kind of solution. And there's this business which is is a little bit gross, at least for me. Um, but when human beings were fairy shot, they often used to develop, um, it's very peculiar, but swellings on their legs, um, typically on their legs, but also on their, their arms. Um, and when these swellings were opened up, things would fall out of them, uh, feathers, twigs, 
um, you know, t uh, bits of grass, hay, things like this. And this was often interpreted as being um, a fairy attack. Wow, that's fascinating. I, I, I had never heard that, that they'd actually I mean, have objects. Absolutely, within. And the best place for this in fairy lore is actually the place where we have the best modern records for is, is um, Nova Scotia. Oh, really? I, I mean, Nova Scotia and also Newfoundland. So Atlantic Canada. You've got to think that Nova Scotia and Newfoundland is more so than Ireland is the place in the Western world where fairy law survived, has survived the longest. Um, I mean, there are beliefs that you will find in Newfoundland that maybe today aren't taken as seriously as they were 20 years ago which it's just from for someone from Britain and Ireland, it's just extraordinary that people had these beliefs that had often died out a couple of hundred years before in Britain. I mean, for example, there is an idea that if you want to protect yourself from fairies and you live in Newfoundland, people will give you a tiny piece of bread to put in your pocket. Um, and this is an idea that is still present today in Newfoundland, but that was acted on very seriously up until the 80s and the 90s in some communities. Um, and yet that idea, you find that idea in Devon, in Britain, in, in the 1700s. I mean, it's, it, but it was an idea that was clearly dying out in Britain then, but that survived on the other side of the Atlantic. Yeah, that that's actually really incredible. I mean, I that you know, I know that there's a a large Irish, you know, immigrant population in Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, they may have brought their beliefs over and for some reason, you know, I think after people emigrate after, you know, some kind of tragedy or what you know like with the potato famine, uh maybe you you cling more to your your roots, you know, so that could explain. That's just a theory I just came up with right now. But <laughs> uh, well done. No, no, no it's it, no. I think it's it's a very credible theory. I mean, one thing that's always been interesting um, about fairy law, it, particularly thinking now of America and Canada, is that most people who specialize in the subject will tell you that fairies um, don't cross the Atlantic. And yet I've just finished doing an article with a wonderful American folklorist and writer named Chris Woodyard, uh, where we've looked at all the different examples of fairy law surviving um, in parts of the United States, um, and particularly in Atlantic Canada. And even uh, like Native Americans and Native Canadians, many of them will have, you know, these kind of stories as well. Right. And this is something I, I should have I should have said. And it is rude for me not to have said. But of course, there were fairies before Europeans ever settled in these areas. There were local fairies. And every so often you get these fascinating overlaps. Um, for example, in England, one of the most famous um, one of the most famous fairy place names. There are lots of places with this name. Is the fairy hole, um, and a fairy hole would be typically a cavern where fairies lived. And in Nova Scotia, there's a very famous cave. I believe it's in the north of Nova Scotia, but please, um, you know, please don't be angry. I've got this wrong. Um, and in that cave, um, presumably there was this idea <coughs> that fairies fairies dwelt to call it the fairy hole is a very british way of referring to it and yet we also know that local indian legends talked about stone gnomes living in this cave wow. and so what what seems to have happened there is that the local european population were talking to first nation um storytellers discovered that this cave was a place that had indian fairies and gave it a name that would have not been out of place in lowland Scotland or northern England. Well, yeah. And I mean, it's fascinating that, you know, these tales already existed here before any Europeans arrived in yeah, North no, Absolutely. Yeah. To, you know, and it's like that it makes you wonder, you know, like, how, how can we explain that? You know, I mean, I, just that... Wait, I we have similar ideas of myth all across, you know, humans, we, we, that nature sparks our imagination in similar ways, or 
Is there something happening out there? Is there something happening? (laughs) I I mean, I I, I would challenge you to find anywhere in the world, uh, any human community, I should say, that at some point in its history has not had fairy beliefs of some kind. The idea that there is this parallel community living outside our own. Um, Now, again, how you explain this is interesting. Is this a belief which has just always been with us? I mean, some of the best modern studies on religion um, suggest that if you go back to the very earliest human communities or their modern representative hunter gatherers, the one thing that the vast majority have in common is what's typically called animism. This idea that the inanimate world around us has spirits within it. Um, So again, this is something which I think you would find in one way or another everywhere. I've got a question from Pete. He's one of my subscribers on Patreon. Pete says, hello, Dr. Young. I hope you are doing well. I have a couple of questions for you. I'd like to hear more on your thoughts about the theosophists and whether you think that ultimately they did more harm than good to fairy folklore, both in terms of active fairy folk belief and academic study. That's his first question. So I'll, I'll right. get with that one and then I'll get, get to the next one. Okay. So first of all, let's just talk about theosophy because I, I imagine that there are some people listening who've never heard of this. Um, in, in the mid 19th century in the United States, um, uh, spiritualism started to become a mass movement. Spiritualism, of course, it is the idea that by sitting around a table or being together with people, but especially what we would call a medium, it was possible to contact other realities and particularly the dead. Sort of um, like a seance type thing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the seance is born out of spiritualism. And theosophy, in a sense, is a wing of this idea of spiritualism that that creates an entire mythology, an entire description of the world um, based around an understanding um, that the world is spiritual and that there are different forces that we can contact. Mm-hmm. Now, what's interesting and the reason the theosophists matter so much in the history of fairies is, is the following reason. The theosophists, um, spiritualists were interested above all in the dead. They were interested in our, our beloved departed, you know, granddad who died. We can sit down in a dark room and talk to this person. Theosophists said, yes, that's true. But you can also interact with other spirits that are not human souls. And theosophists said these are what have traditionally been called fairies. And so they they created um, they created really, I would call it a new mythology of fairies. And this linked in often to this Victorian idea of the sugar plum fairy. Theosophist fairies are often much sweeter and kinder than traditional fairies. And the other thing about theosophist fairies is in theosophy, there's this very, very strong idea that fairies are natural forces. In other words, that every plant has its own fairy, and that fairy is what allows the plant to grow. Um, And this is something that if you sit down with your children and watch Tinkerbell cartoons today, Mm -hmm. you know, the Disney Tinkerbell series, I mean, in some ways, wonderful cartoons, but it's just it, it it's the cartoon version of theosophy because these fairies go around um, managing the natural world, whereas that's not actually what we hear about from fairies earlier on in history. So if some of your listeners have this idea that fairies are, you know, I have a rose bush outside the window of the room where I am now. A theosophist would say, well, there are fairies in your garden because the fairies will look after this rose bush. Right. Um, th- this idea is it's not really there in earlier f- fairy lore. Um, there are hints of it, and there are hints that fairies help the seasons. Right, but yeah. it's, it's not mainstream whereas in theosophy it really really is important and when we look at fairies in children's fiction today <coughs> or films they are almost always the theosophist version of fairies now 
um, your, your your question was was saying, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, I mean, I, I have my own, let's say, aesthetic views on this. But what I would say is that when you're dealing with folklore and beliefs like this, in the end, you don't get to say whether it's good or bad. These ideas have gone mainstream. They're there. And when people see fairies today, they very often see theosophy fairies. And for me, there's just no arguing with that. It's just it's it's the way that folklore it's the way that ideas about the supernatural develop. And we may find some of those more or less attractive personally. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm not a big fan of theosophy or theosophical fairies. But it's it's something that's become real. It's just part of the texture of modern fairy belief. And and actually, that really segues well into his next question, which is, do you think that pop culture has bled too much into fairy lore, shaping perceptions of the other folk and influencing encounters? Or do you think that pop culture is keeping fairies alive yeah. in an age where they may have disappeared from cultural me memory long before? Thanks yeah, for that. I, I Sorry, go on. Yeah, these th no, these are excellent questions. Um, I, I instinctively, when I heard you read out that question, you read the first part and then you read the second part. And as you were reading the second part, I, part of me inside shouted, yes, that's it. <laughs> and I, I, I have three daughters. Um, and not only, obviously, I've day-to-day -day contact with them, but I also have contact through them with a much wider circle uh, of children uh, and i i've seen the way that fairy law has remained alive um thanks to these um thanks to popular culture and purists and in a sense i am a purist purists might be irritated by the version of fairies we get but i think i i, I would be something is better than nothing and for me it's very valuable that my children watch tinkerbell cartoons and grow up with ideas of fairies that they have access to these magical worlds um and maybe later on they will have a chance to explore other ideas of fairies um but i, I i'm I, I guess i'm i'm kind of part of me is a snob and looks down on this stuff but part of me thinks i'm glad i'm glad that fairies are there in popular culture because it, it really gives access to new generations um who are interested in these things and i think one of the great dangers the modern western world faces is that we become too materialistic we leave behind everything that's spiritual um i mean in the last century there has been a retreat from god and belief in god which is really just extraordinary mm. um and i i i think that any chance our children get to have any hint even of something transcendental something that is beyond us something that is spiritual is a good thing because this is part of the human makeup and it's it's you know it's it's very dangerous to cut people off from that entirely do you think that there's a sense in which we um, we need to in some way believe in the fairies in order for them to continue to exist i mean definitely in our own imaginations but <laughs> I'm just thinking about Peter Pan and, uh, oh, yes. you know, that moment from the play where it, it, the Tinkerbell is in trouble and, and then he, they say to the children, you need to clap, clap if you believe in fairies. And uh, and this this is what brings her back, you know, and, and I was thinking about another just because we're talking about pop culture. I was thinking about another old movie, uh, The Never Ending Story. I don't know if you know that one. Yes, I watched it with my children recently. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and, and you know, they it's sort of a, an alternate fairy world that that whole story takes place in. And the nothing is taking over this yes, fairy yes. world. And it's because people ha are no longer believing in it. And this is what is destroying it. Do you think that we sort of have that sense about the fairies and and also that we kind of look back on, you know, the people people from the past and and their beliefs almost kind of wistfully you know, that they lived in a more magical time and that children live in a more magical existence where you know, these beliefs are more real to them, you know? Well, I, I, I'm going to answer this question and I, I'm not sure I'm really answering it entirely in the spirit that you want me to. Um, but the way I look at this is I think that I, I grew up in the countryside. I grew up on a farm when I was very young 
Um, and I, I live now on the edge of the countryside. I, I, I go into the countryside every day. Um, and I, I think a very we're becoming rapidly. We've gone from being human beings who farmed the land or before that who hunted over the land. We've gone from human beings who did this to being industrial human beings. And now we're becoming digital human beings to the extent where so much of our lives actually takes place on the Internet or in cyberspace. And I think one of the great things about fairies is fairies are away. I mean, let's just let's just say for a second that fairies are not real, that they're just something that we've created for ourselves to relate to the world. Even if you reduce fairies just to that, that the extraordinary value that fairies have, and this is particularly true, I think, with children, is to reconnect ourselves with the wilds around us. Because, and I think this is another problem with modern the modern world, yeah. is that most of us just live. We, we don't have a day-to-day -day relationship with the countryside around us. Maybe if we're enthusiastic, once a week we go out for a walk in the countryside or something like this. And I, I, what I like, I, one of the reasons I think fairies appeal to me is because fairies are calling us back to this reality that is is non-human in the world, if that makes sense. Yeah, it definitely does. It you know because it, there are so many things that I still feel that you know even with our all of our scientific advancements that we we don't understand and I don't want to give up that idea of. But if I can just chip in there, you, you say that there are some things that with all our scientific understandings, we, we don't get what really terrifies me is it's because of our scientific understandings. We don't get some of these things. Yeah. In, in other words, th there are some things that we've actually started to lose touch with things that our ancestors um, a century ago would have found quite natural um, and I think that any chance that we have to, to reconnect, not necessarily to come up with answers, but just to be aware that there are problems and issues there, anything that helps us do that is a good thing. I'm going to shift focus slightly. Um, I wanted to ask you about the connection between fairies and ghosts. We've talked a bit about ghosts, but in a lot of the particularly Irish stories that I've read, you you find fairies you know, sort of with ghosts, you know, if somebody will, will find themselves among a, a fairy dance or something like that. And then they'll see, you know, their cousin that died last <laughs> year, who's there dancing with the fairies. What's the relationship there? Right. This, this is a question. This is another of these questions that bothers me that I, I again, I don't quite lie awake at night thinking about it, but it's something I've never really got my head around. Um, and all I can say to you is this, that particularly when you think of Britain, there isn't much by way of stories like this, where um, people interrelating with the fairies come across um the dead or at least because they're not necessarily dead sometimes they've just been stolen by the fairies mm. however in ireland it's it's a big issue and we talked before about the famous bridget cleary case uh, where this poor woman was burnt because um her family believed she was a fairy and her husband was prepared to act on that information um but there were there were some amazing cases from ireland from the 1860s 1870s where people um people would interact with the fairies because they believed that their their kin had died and gone to the fairies or they believed that their kin had been stolen and taken to the fairies um and so th these two things definitely wrap around each other <coughs> and some people um there's a, a famous scottish folklorist called lewis spence um, Lewis Spence argued that the fairies are our ancestors, that the fairies are this parallel community of the dead that share the landscape with us. And I, I think the only answer I would give to this and for your listeners is that it's possible that 2000 years ago or 4000 years ago, this was true in Neolithic times. But at least the way that fairies are seen in historic times, this was not usually the case and that it's important to say that in these Irish stories you're talking about, there's always a very clear difference between fairies 
and their human prisoners or human spirits who live with them. Um, and in a sense, fairies take on the role of angels in paradise. They're guardians, sometimes prison guardians. I mean, it's not always necessarily very pleasant of these human spirits, but they don't seem to be the same thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it does. And I, and I think, I mean, in the stories that I've read, it, it almost seems like people think that, or people used to think that fairies and go, fairies were almost a type of ghost, you know, or that a ghost that had taken on <laughs> these, these extra magical features. Um, like, I know in certain Japanese stories, you have these ideas that, that if you know, like a fo the fox fairy the the kitsune i can probably not pronouncing that right where right. the fox has, has lived for so long that it it gains extra abilities or, or powers <laughs> and, you know maybe there could be something going on there similar with the beliefs but um that that were there in ireland but um i i think it's hard to to pick them apart now because they, we just have the stories themselves rather than people explaining what they felt about them. <laughs> you know? But I, I think if you, if you go back to Ireland again in the 19th century, I mean, there we, we have something much, much better than stories. We have judicial cases. We have legal cases where um, people actually ended up in court typically because a woman and it was usually a woman had convinced the local community that she con could she was in contact with the fairies and that she could also um bring back human spirits from the fairy world and she these people were prosecuted by the british government um which of course controlled ireland at that date um as um i mean what was what's the word we would use today i suppose as confidence tricksters mm -hmm. um and I probably in some senses they were, but there's one extraordinary case from near Waterford in Ireland. I, I believe it's from the 1860s where a woman managed to convince the local policeman and a series of other people that she was able to bring back human spirits from the fairy world. And they had to give her food because by giving them human food, um, she was able to bring these spirits back and in court. And this is all reported in the newspapers of the day. It's, it's a really extraordinary um, series of accounts. But in court, there's a description of how um, how these people were taken by this woman to a place and they would see their dead relatives in the field in front of them. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's so exciting because there you have not just the story, but real beliefs where people were giving lots and lots of food over to this woman. Um, and again, we can we can talk about her motives and we can talk about what really happened. But for me, what's perhaps most interesting is is this very strong drive among these people to believe. Well, I my channel, you know, is all about fairy encounters and people send their encounters to me and I narrate them. And I also tell fairy stories that are fictional. Um, but I think that there's a particular type of person I would say that, that either has these encounters or is, or has a fascination with fairies like the two of us. Um, what can you tell me, you know, in the research that you've done about those of us that uh, have this fascination with fairies or those of us who have had encounters? Well, I, I would say there's a difference between those two categories um, in that mm, I mean, being fascinated in fairies, it, it, it seems to be a certain, I mean, there seems to be a, that a certain type of person gets involved with these things, um, often rather eccentric people. And certainly I would class myself in that category. Um, yeah, me too. But when, when you look at people who see fairies and remember that lots of people have one-off experiences in their lives but what i'm particularly interested in is by people who have serial experiences in other words that they they've often in their life had supernatural experiences or you know in some cases almost have relationships with spirits around them mm -hmm. <laughs> 
these these people usually have a very um special psychology let's say and over the years there have been various academic studies looking at people who have these kind of experiences and the numbers vary but crudely speaking it's estimated that something like anything between five and twenty percent of people have had supernatural experiences what they consider to be supernatural experiences and that within that number there's a smaller number you know maybe one or two percent of the population who have a great number of experiences um very regular experiences and i mean just to put this in perspective i I mean, for example, the UK has a population of 60 million. Let's give that conservative number of 2% of the population. I mean, we're talking about a million, a million and a half people. It's, it, you know, it's, when you think of it like that, we're talking about a huge group. Yeah. Um, you know, th this is, and this is a part of, of society, which to some extent has been disenfranchised because 4,000 years ago, these people were the druids. These people were the witch doctors. These were the people who communicated between you and me, the human community, and the spirits beyond. Um, and these people, in a sense, they have a skill set which is no longer required by mainstream society. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 but that's fascinating that there's so many people that have had these experiences. I mean, I definitely... I, I get a lot of them coming into my inbox and I'm always fascinated every time I get one and I'm excited and uh, happy that I'm going to be able to read another one. Um, but, you know, it just amazes me that there's so many people having these experiences. And I think some people are quite shy about sharing them, but, you know, they, they strongly, they will strongly believe that they, this, this happened to them. And, and, uh, you know, they know that uh, there's a lot of people out there that don't believe, but, you know, they have these strong beliefs and they're willing to stand by them. And I, yeah, I, I, I think that, um, I think one of the nice things about people of fairy experiences is that, uh, I mean, it, when I get emails in my inbox, there are two things that worry me. Um, the first thing is if people are having experiences, which are consistently, um threatening mm -hmm. and the second is if people have a lot of experiences now i think that if someone has a lot of experiences and they're usually positive or if someone has um a lot of experiences or, or sorry let's say the odd threatening experience but it's something you know that there is manageable within their life that's one thing but you then i i think you do come across and i very 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 rarely come across people in this category i must say but you have people who feel this as a terrible burden Mm, yeah, uh, I, I, the, I have had people say that in some of the stories they've submitted to me that. Well, but I, yeah, it, the, but the, the nightmare situation here is that you, you have people who feel it is a terrible burden and risk getting sucked into our mental care sectors or this kind of thing. Where, when very often people are actually able to deal with these things very well on their own. Mm -hmm. And if you're talking about one or two percent of society, which has not just supernatural experiences, but relatively frequent supernatural experiences, I mean, probably in evolutionary terms, there's a reason for this. Um, and lots of people in that category have very full and meaningful lives where they're extremely connected to the community around them um, and, you know, where they, they lead extremely positive existences. And so I think one of the things I've always been interested on this uh, on, in the side is the way that our society generally is very bad at handling this. Yeah, yeah, and, and, like you know, just shunting people off and in deciding that they're mentally ill or whatever it is. It, we... I, I mean, I don't know if you've ever come across this phrase, but if you go to a psychiatrist and talk to a psychiatrist about issues you are having, you'll have someone staring across at you at the desk and listening to you. If you ever say to that person, "I hear voices," mm. then everything changes yeah. you know their, their eyebrows will go up and you yeah, i mean you, you people have to be very careful about the way they express themselves um 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that because that can be risky, especially yes. you, you don't want to end up uh, drugged up. And <laughs> you know. no, no, well, but I mean, there are there are some nightmarish stories. And I talked to you earlier um, about a woman, a woman I greatly, greatly admire, who unfortunately died um, just a few years ago now. Uh, Marjorie Johnson. She was a British fairyist. Um, I edited and helped publish her lifetime work which is called seeing fairies in 2014 um and where she basically did a version of what you're doing now and a version of what i've done with the fairy census where she collected lots of different accounts together <coughs> and the incredible thing about marjorie johnson is that unlike me marjorie johnson had practically daily fairy experiences i mean fairy experiences were just part of her life wow. and it's wonderful reading um reading her descriptions because she i mean she was clearly fairies were just 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 like a dog in her life they were just part of her life i mean they were always present for her and she she started the Fairy Investigation Society again. Is that right, it's, the again is the important word. So the yeah. Fairy Investigation Society was this society that began in the 20s and 30s. And, and then she it died. brought it back. Yeah. That's right. It died just before the Second World War. In the Second World War, um, the documents of the society were lost, apparently in a German bombing attack. Um, and after the war, um, one of the original founders um, basically came across Marjorie Johnson um, and set up the society with her as secretary. And this man rightly recognized that she was a very energetic and dedicated person. And, and she, she was this marvelous individual and she she'd had all her life, but from her earliest childhood experiences of seeing fairies, she grown up in a very understanding family um, and she just basically integrated this in her life. But she'd gone out and she tried to create for herself a network of other people who had similar experiences. And so she set up the Fairy Investigation Society um, in the. She let's say she ran it in the 1950s. And, um, and what was their primary mission? Right. This is something. I, so I help run the Fairy Investigation Society today. And it's interesting to talk about the difference here. Um, the Fairy Investigation Society in the 1950s were for those who believed in fairies. It wasn't necessary to have fairy experiences, but the people who belonged had had um, at least had belief in fairies, the reality of fairies. Um, we say when people ask about joining the, the Fairy Investigation Society today, we always say that all that matters is that you're interested in fairies. Oh, in so other words, can join if they want? Anyone can join. The only condition is that they're interested in fairies. And if I can just take a moment for a brief bit of publicity on this. Sure. Um, the modern Fairy Investigation Society basically has two parts to it. Twice a year, we send out an electronic newsletter. <coughs> and then the other thing, we have a fairly active Facebook page, fairly active in that we put up five or six posts a week. Um, and I'm particularly proud. Um, I have someone who helps me with that, who really is actually the heart of the Facebook operation, who puts up the most exquisite fairy art. Um, and she, she manages to find fairy art in places that no one else has. Um, and so we, we have these these. There are two parts to the society. Um, there is no money involved. Absolutely. Um, and what I always say to people, or I always try and mention on radio programs, is if any of your listeners are interested, can I just give the email address of the society? Sure, absolutely. And I, yeah. I'm going to put it in the description afterwards. Great. Uh, that, that, so the, the email of the society is, it's all one word, Fairy Investigation Society. And fairy is spelt F A. I R Y. In other words, the 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 old classical spelling of fairy. So it's one word, fairy investigation society at gmail.com. Um, and if 
And if somebody wants to join, they, they just send you an email and they send us an email. And what I would say is it is extremely low maintenance in that if you want to be involved and you want to write articles for our newsletter and get involved with Facebook, you can do that. But you can also just sign up. Membership lists are kept very confidential. We have about 300 members. Um, and it's really just for anyone who's interested, be they believers or not in fairy law. And there is I, I'm really quite proud of our newsletters because they, they usually run to about 15,000 or 20,000 words. I mean, they're, they're very short books, if you like. And we've now had eight of them and we do interviews. We, we have articles on fairy law. We have descriptions of people seeing fairies. So we have all these things and people are very welcome. I mean, we've never said no to anyone who wants to join. You just send an email. Um, the only thing I'd say is that there is, I know on the internet, um, a another organization calling it the Fairy Investigation Society, which strangely came into existence a couple of months after ours. And all I would say is, please be careful about the email you write to. So, okay. you know, it's one of, yeah. Well, what I'll do is I'm going to put the actual email in the description. So anybody who wants to join can make sure they get the right Fairy Investigation Society. Yes, that yes. Like a lot of fun. I mean, what a, you could introduce, what a way to introduce yourself if you, you know, hello, I'm a member of the Fairy Investigation Society. <laughs> this is it. Um, I, I always, when I do interviews, I, I'm, I'm always interested in the way that particularly mainstream journalists, you know, they asked me a little bit about fairies, the history of fairies, but it's the Fairy Investigation Society they're most intrigued by. I think the idea that there are people who, um, you know, share information on fairies is, I, I, but I, I understand this, but it's just, it's so peculiar, I think, for many people that they're fascinated by it. Well, what about the fairy census that uh, you're running? Uh, what can can people get involved in that? And right, so so let me explain what happened there. Um, Marjorie Johnson, who I mentioned before, wrote over the course literally of fifty years. She lived till she was a hundred and one. Um, a book full of fairy experiences. I brought this book out in 2014 with Anomalous Press. It's called Seeing Fairies. Um, and it's it's one of the best collections of modern fairy sightings. Um, and I, I mean, I'd say it's the best, really. Um, it was it was the love of Marjorie Johnson's life preparing this collection. You know, she went into infinite detail and infinite efforts to do it well. Um, and I, I when I published this, I thought, you know, really, we should do this again. That Marjorie Johnson had done this in the 40s and the 50s by writing painstakingly to every newspaper she could find in the English speaking world saying, can you publish this letter, please? I'm looking for people who've seen fairies write to me at my address in Nottingham. And so obviously there was no email back there, but every day she'd come home and, you know, one day in three, she'd find a letter on her doormat with someone saying, I saw a fairy. <laughs> and I, I, I thought it would be really interesting to do this again using the Internet and perhaps particularly social media for publicity. Well, I know a lot of my subscribers and people who come to my channel have had these kind of experiences and they've so many of them have shared them with me so they can share them with you as well and be be a part Absolutely. of the fairy census. So just, just, just to explain where we're at with the fairy census, because the fairy census mark one is now finished. Um, and that is basically we I, I found well, I, I was sent in 500 descriptions. I, I called it a day when we got to 500 um, 500 descriptions of fairy sightings. And I've now published that for free on the Internet as a PDF. Um, and if you type in fairy census into Google, you, you very quickly find the PDF. Um, and it's it's hundreds of pages of fairy sightings. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff that's very enjoyable there. But I'm now getting underway with the second fairy census. And I think we're already at about 150 sightings. And my hope is to republish the second fairy census when we get to 500 again. So this will be in 2022 or, you know, it will be in the future. Um, 
and so that's great. So people can really can share their stories and be involved in this. Right. And there are two ways that you can do this. And th this is the thing I would um, I would say that the first thing that I prepared a questionnaire for the fairy census. And this questionnaire is, is actually quite long. I think that if you give time to it, you could easily spend 30 or 40 minutes. And for example, it asks questions like, what time of day did you see the fairy? Um, are you male or female? Um, how old were you when you saw the fairy? How old are you now? Um, do you read fairy books? Do you have eye conditions? I mean, there are lots of different questions that are asked around the basic experience the person sends in. And so what I would say is if people have had experiences, we would be incredibly grateful if you could write into Google fairy census, you'll immediately come to the page um, on the Google findings um, which allows you to fill in the fairy census. And incidentally, on that same page, there is the PDF of the first fairy census if you just want to download it and enjoy it. Um, and then you would go through this questionnaire and then that will be automatically filed away on the internet. And it goes without saying that we guarantee complete confidentiality. Uh, for example, we put down the general region of the United States, but we would never say the town or city someone comes from. So we're, we're very, very careful to protect anonym, anonymity. anonymity. Um, but the, the other thing I'd say is this, that if someone's listening and they're, they're really interested in passing on experiences, but they either cannot be bothered to do a questionnaire or they would just be irritated to do a questionnaire. The other possibility is you just write to the Fairy Investigation Society and send in an email with your experience because most of the stuff in the fairy census were people who'd gone through the questionnaire. But like you, I get emails of people who've had fairy experiences where I just, I can, you know, just cut and paste these basically and put them into the file. And I'd like to just say to everybody, um, if you guys, if any of you have already sent me um, a story, you can send that same story into the Fairy Investigation Society. You could just copy and paste it or, you know, forward that same email if you don't want to go through the questionnaire. But I think that's really cool to, you know, participate in something like that. And I think a lot of my uh, subscribers are going to be interested in that. I mean, one of the things I, I've always said when I'm asked about this census is that when Marjorie Johnson did what effectively was an earlier fairy census, she, the thing that she wanted to understand was what what it, what are fairies? And I think that I have a slightly different aim in this. Um, my aim is to understand not what fairies are, but what kind of people see fairies and under what conditions. Um Having said that, if you're much more in Marjorie Johnson's line and you're interested in what fairies are, I promise you that you will enjoy reading the, the fairy census, which is now online. Like I say, it's hundreds of pages of people's descriptions and it's it's a rainbow collection. There is It's from all around the world and there are just lots and lots of different, you know, unusual accounts. Well, maybe I could uh, narrate some of them on my channel. That might be no, no, you'd be no, it'd be a really good source, and you'd be really, really welcome to. I mean, all you'd have to do is download this file, browse till you found some that you found interesting, and then you'd be really welcome. I, the only thing I'd ask, not as a legal requirement, but just as a courtesy, is that you mention it comes from the fairy census, and that if anyone else wants. You know, I'm always keen to get people to send in so we can move to fairy census too. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I definitely. But that, yeah, that could be fun. I, I would love to t take a look and actually narrate them and put them to music and photographs as I do on the channel. And oh, wow. Well, th there are some really good ones. W when I brought out the fairy census, I, you can imagine I've had different reactions to it. But one of the reactions that most excited me was there was a, a, an American, a young American woman who wrote to me and said that she wanted to make some episodes from the fairy census into a graphic novel. Oh. So, in other words, perhaps a graphic novel is not quite the right word, but she wanted to make as comic strips, um, you know, 20 or 30 of the most interesting experiences. And as far as I'm concerned, this census does not belong to me. It belongs to the world. I mean, anyone can do what they want with it. So it's, you know, it's out there and it's there to be used. Oh, well, that's great.
How can you tell us a little bit about your book, Magical Folk? It sounds really interesting. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but it's on my Christmas list. Right. Uh, can you tell me? Can you tell me about it? What? Well, so what happened was. Um, I, I I've I've been writing about fairies now as an academic for I, I suppose six years, and one of the things I found early on was I, I I discovered that fairy lore changes a lot from place to place. Um, so in other words, if you go to Newfoundland and ask people about fairies, you'll get very different answers from Ireland, or you'll get very different answers uh, from Cornwall, and so. As I kept studying fairies, I became more and more frustrated that lots of people just wrote very general things about fairies. Whereas what you really need to do, I think, to understand fairy law is to get down to what people in given places believed. And so what I tried to do was I, I have a colleague named Kerry, and she's the co-editor of the book, Kerry Holbrook, who's um, a British academic, a British folklorist, very, very capable young woman. And um, I and Kerry got together a team of people, there were 14 people, who would write about fairies from different places. So in other words, people weren't writing about, I don't know, fairies in the wild hunt or fairies in elf shot. They were writing everything they could about fairies from Cornwall or fairies from Ireland or fairies from Scotland. Or, it has and, a specific location focus. That's right. That's right. And so all of the, I think, I, I think I'm right in saying there were 15 chapters, 15, and that each chapter is about a given place. For example, the great British folklorist Jacqueline Simpson wrote a beautiful chapter on the fairies of Sussex. Um, so there are these different places. And I, I think one of the nice things about the book is not just that there's information about different places, but that the different authors are very, very different people. I said to you before that people who are interested in fairies, and I, I think you agreed with me, tend to be a little bit eccentric. Yeah. And everyone who wrote in this book is eccentric. And so there are there are some very kind of weirdly different chapters but as a whole i think if you read it it, it makes a, a nice introduction to fairies and we also included in there mm -hmm. three chapters um on fairies abroad and the, the book is about british and irish fairies and so three of the chapters were about british and irish fairies in north america and one of those chapters was written by me about Atlantic Canada or the Maritimes, basically. One of the chapters was about New England fairies um, by a very talented um, New England folklorist. And then one of the chapters, one of my favorites, um, was by a woman I've already mentioned, Chris Woodyard, about the, the fairies of Iowa, believe it or not. And um, a, an extraordinary case from the 19th century where a young Irish woman uh, living, I think, in Iowa City. I could have got this wrong, though. Um, but she is kidnapped by the fairies. Um, and so there's this wonderful chapter about belief in fairies in the Midwest. Wow. That, I mean, that sounds great. So, so anybody who's interested in picking up this book, there's a link in the description you can follow. And I'm sure it's available at bookstores, but the link is is to an online where you can order it and you can you yeah. can get like a I mean if I can chip in there as well, um it was published in Britain. And so it's available in Britain and Ireland in a very easy way. However, having said that, I've sent it to various colleagues and ex students in the United States. Um, and so it's, it's, I mean, you can definitely go on Amazon or an alternative site and order it. You might have to wait a little bit longer than you would for your normal book, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. but it will but definitely get there. Yeah. And it sounds interesting and you, you're going to get a whole bunch of information on fairies there. And I love that dividing them into locations because then you can sort of compare and contrast them. Yes. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's for me. It's it's one of these things where I had a vision, if you like, of doing this, and the the reality actually proved almost better than I'd imagined. And I think the secret behind it was that different voices describe these different places. And so, if you open the, the different chapters, are a very are just well, very different. Not just different in terms of places, but in approach, in terms of the voice. I mean. There are university professors who've written chapters um, and there are 
fairy believers who've written chapters. There are people from very different backgrounds. Wow. Well, I recommend you guys pick that one up. Um, and again, it's it's in the description. I'm going to go to the chat now and we're going to see what everybody's saying. If anybody has some questions. Oh, we got a super chat from Chrissy Domain. Uh, wow. Thanks, Chrissy. She says, Merry Christmas, Scary Fairy Godmother. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas to you, too. Um, we have a comment from Thomas Brooks. He says he's an illustrator and would love to create physical depictions of the beings from the stories. I'm, I'm guessing he means from the fairy census for the purposes of cataloging. I, maybe that's something he can send you by email. Oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm always fascinated by these things. Um, and it, uh, like I say, the fairy census is out there for anyone to use as they please. So, um, you know, he, he would be, I, I'd really advise him to, to download the PDF and enjoy it at first hand. Yeah, you should definitely do that, Thomas. Um, someone saying maybe the Greek gods are actually fairies. That was Spoon10756 made that comment. You know, I, I've I've read that, you know, that, 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 that our belief in gods could have over time, you know, had contributed in some way, you know, especially some of the Greek gods, as he says, like they have a very, this connection to nature. Uh, like we we spoke about that earlier, but it's a very interesting comment. Um, Chrissy Dahman, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, Chrissy. Uh, she said she saw a globe of light speed down her hall and disappear, and her dog chased it. Mm. Wow, that's that. If Chrissy reads the fairy census, this is something which has changed. When Marjorie Johnson did the fairy census in the 50s there were not much many descriptions of globes of light whereas today um in the fairy census there are not hundreds but there are tens of descriptions of people's encounters with globes of light and you know seeing them as fairies yeah, so like, she's in she's in good company and like will o the wisps i always found fascinating will o the wisps yeah. Yeah, yeah the idea that you know you've seen these lights between the trees and and following yeah. and them taking you on a on a wild ride <laughs> I, I mean in in um fairy lore in britain there is the idea that the willow wind wisps and fairies blend into each other they're they're often confused i mean the idea that in traditional folklore that fairies can be seen as lights is quite common mm -hmm. yeah and and like the whole like the jack-o-lantern and yes um whimsy artistry says that he or she is thinking of sending in some of uh his experiences his or her i'm sorry uh when they have time so that's great uh reika yamazaka wants to know more about the fairy called the Gon <laughs> the gonkana which i i'm not i'm never sure if i'm pronouncing that correctly that's a fairy that has been featured on the channel a few times the love talker i don't know if you've heard of that that I've girl. never heard of that. So what from what part of the world does this fairy come? Ireland. And I sort of found I discovered this guy in my research and he sort of um he he sort of smokes a pipe. Well, he has a pipe but he, there's never any smoke coming out of it and he likes to seduce women. And uh he's he's been quite popular on the channel. A lot of people have been sending uh stories featuring this guy so um and i did a whole video dedicated to him which i'll send you um since you've never you don't know about this guy but he's quite obscure no, i've um, never heard of him yeah and i i discovered him and i found him interesting so i started talking about him on the channel and it, he seemed to have become a thing <laughs> Uh, Jesse H says uh, she's had so many supernatural experiences in her life and uh, the things that we were saying earlier, you know, about to the type of people, I guess we're all eccentric people here, but she said she swears, she swears to God, this is so true of her. Mm -hmm. uh, and she also would like to know about fairy paths, more about them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, fairy paths are... Um, this is something particularly associated with Ireland. And there's the idea that the fairy group A live in this hill. Fairy group B live in a bay under the sea. Um, fairy group C live on that mountain. And there's this idea that 
there are lines or roads between these different places. So there's a sense that the fairies can travel from, if you like, castle to castle or stronghold to stronghold. And these roads are normally um, straight roads. And it's it's interesting that some people have linked this in. I'm a little bit skeptical about this, but it's interesting. Some people have linked this into ideas about ley lines in Britain, the idea that there are straight lines that cross the landscape mm -hmm. and that go through certain significant places. Yeah, um, a few people in the chat were mentioning ley lines when we were yeah. talking about that. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. <clears throat> and just, just so you know, the in the 19th century but i mean this is something that still today you get references to people knew that the fairies were traveling when they saw whirlwinds on these lines right. um so in other words if they saw an eddy um a wind with maybe some leaves blowing around in it they would say oh my goodness the these are the fairies and there is a wonderful um, Irish oil painting from the 1850s that shows a group of Irish men and women walking down a road. They come from different social classes and all of them look petrified. And if you look at the painting, you think, what on earth is happening in this painting? Yeah. Um, but actually, the reason is that in the bottom left hand corner of the painting, there are five or six leaves whirling around. They think they've come face to face with the fairies. Oh, wow. That's it's a wonderful painting. But, yeah, I have to look that one up. Melissa RMT wants to know if you know anything about the Atacama <coughs> fairy remains. Uh, can you tell me that again? Sorry, the, the Atacama fairy remains. I guess that's the Atacama yeah. desert. Um, is this the is this the famous case? There's a, a kind of a small humanoid who's who's bent over. Uh, it's it's. I would guess that's probably what she she's asking about. Yeah, no, I'm I'm afraid I I have read about that, but I I don't know about it. No, and I I um I'm I'm trying to remember. I I read a good chapter about that, but I can't remember where. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, Thomas Brooks would like to know, he says, can either of you give your thoughts on the neo-pagan movement and how it has influenced an evolved belief, I guess, in fairies? Uh, it doesn't have to be positive or negative thing. He's just interested in our thoughts. Yeah, I, 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 well, I don't know what your thoughts are there, but I, I, I would say that the, the neo-pagan movement is, is, I mean, above all, it's neo. It's it's a new movement. Um, I mean, this isn't something that was there 150 years ago. And so people in this movement are essentially inventing in a very creative way a series of traditions. Um, I, In the fairy senses, there are lots of neo-pagans who sent in their experiences. And my suspicion is that in the same way in the in the 19th century theosophy defined fairies and 20th century sightings look back to theosophy in the 19th century my suspicion is in the 21st century a lot of the things that take place in the sightings will depend on neo-paganism so for me that's really the modern equivalent of theosophy and again i don't mean that in a good or bad way but i think that in a sense, they're, they're defining the new limits of what fairies will be. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I think that there is a particular interest in this subject in the neo-pagan community. So yeah, absolutely. it's definitely interesting. And they're, I, I mean, I love that they're keeping this alive. Um, Julian Snape says one of the better pop culture takes on fairies today is probably Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell by Susanna Clarke. Did you read that one? No, I've not read that. Yeah, it's a novel. I, I haven't actually read it either, but it, it had been recommended to me a few times, but uh, I heard that it was quite good. Um, let's see here. John Doe 2 says that he thinks fairies are fallen angels that didn't agree with either God or the devil. Uh, that's definitely possible. Um, that's the traditional Irish belief. That's, I mean, that's what I, people in Ireland will always tell you about fairies. Um, and he also wants to know more about fairy forts. I mean, so fairy forts, um, are these traditional, they're, they're Neolithic sites. Mm -hmm. So they date to a period of Irish history 
um, when um, there were lots of small communities. And actually, these forts, in many cases, perhaps were more, perhaps it would be truer to say they were compounds. They were they were early farms. And yet in history, as time has gone by, the, these sites were abandoned. But because they're quite established in the landscape, uh, they were just left there. Um, and with time, there was also this superstition that as farmers, you shouldn't mess around with them because the fairies live there. And this is something that we haven't talked about with fairies, but which is interesting. Um, right through fairy law, and this is true today, it was true 500 years ago. <clears throat> there is the idea that fairies are an older version of ourselves. Right. Um, and so, for example, if you go to early medieval Ireland, we have a number of records about the fairies that suggest that people living in what today are the fairy forts, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So these were people who were living on these farms that are today fairy forts, but then were going concerns associated the fairies with Neolithic sites in Ireland, like Newgrange, which, if you like, was the period before. And so, the, you know, we're always connecting the fairies with the kind of the period before, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I think that's fascinating. And he also wants to know about fairy trees. Right. So fairy trees um, in Ireland, typically they're fairy, for, uh, fairy thorns. Right. They're and, thorn bushes. And, you know, God help you if you cut down one of these th fairy thorns. And how do you know if it's a fairy thorn? Is there just, is there a... Well, um, typically it works like this. If a thorn is on its own, then it's a fairy thorn. In other words, if you have a, kind, a grove of thorns, a group of thorns, they're nothing special. But if you're, you find yourself in a landscape and there is one thorn, the idea is that's a fairy thorn. And I mean, still today, Irish planning... Uh, for roads is to some extent based on local sensibilities about cutting down thorns or on uprooting sorry uprooting is not the right word but digging up fairy forts uh, because there is there are sometimes local concerns about this does that work with you know individual trees in the middle of a field or it has to be a thorn um, it's it's almost always a thorn. Right. I, I'd also say that if you're interested in fairy trees, I, I wrote an article a couple of years ago, and it's on the internet. I think it's called "In Search of England's Fairy Trees." And in that article, I I try and look for trees about fairy trees from from Britain, well, from England particularly. And what I found there was I found relatively few references. But in England, when you do get them, it's not thorns; it's oak trees. Uh, um, there are, uh, in Britain, particularly in England and Wales, we have about nine references to fairy trees. And I think I'm right in saying that all nine of them are oak trees. Yeah. And you, you, you kind of, I can understand where that would come from because some of these older oak trees, they, they almost seem to have a personality and sometimes like a ace in the bar. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, guys, I'm going to do two more quick questions, and then I think that we're going to sign off. I hope everyone's enjoyed it. I'm going to get to one more question by Ellie Vera. I hope I pronounced your name right. Uh, she would like us or you to explain where the idea of making deals or bargains with fairies came from. Right. Well, the first thing I'd say is that's not actually that common in folklore. But what's interesting is it's there in the background of contracts. And that's the only word I would use, um, the only word I can find, between local fairy doctors. Now, again, fairy doctors is this term for people who have lots of supernatural experiences and can act as a go-between between between the human community and fairies. And these people, and th this was something that was mentioned earlier, they essentially have fairy familiars. They have fairies who will serve them, but in return, that there is there's a quid pro quo here that the fairy you will give me power, but I will give you things in return. And these things could be rituals, these things could be favors. They, I mean, they could be any number of things. And is um, that where, like, a story, like for example, like Rumpelstiltskin would come from, where you know he made he he made a deal and. Uh, 
to help this woman. And uh, and oh, then I think she owed him her, her firstborn child. Right. Well, I, I would my my instinctive answer is yes. But I know there are lots of people who know more about this out there who would disagree with me, who would say I'm being a bit melodramatic. But I, I think actually that link between um, how can we say this? The link between um, the the fairy seer and the fairy does involve something like a contract. Right. Um, I just got a quick super chat here from Cultural Hybrid. She says, much love to you and thanks for your stories. Thank you so much. That's so nice of you. I'm going to got one more question from one of my Patreon subscribers, Katie O'Brien. She would like to know if you have found for fairy folklore in other countries all over the world. She says, I know they're not called fairies everywhere, but even if named otherwise, they should be recognizable as fairy counterparts. It's yeah, I know th th this is spot on. Yeah, I, I think we talked about it a little bit at the beginning, but Katie's hit the nail on the head by saying, don't don't get misled by the name. Mm -hmm. you, you, you mustn't think these things are called pixies or trows. Therefore, they're not fairies. Fairies a name which has been used in one small part of the world and which has entered the English language and which is our way of describing these these beings. But I, I challenge anyone to go to a traditional society and not find fairies they're everywhere this is just part of human experience and again what you make of this and this was a point you you came up with earlier is interesting i mean are we are we looking there at something which is so ancestral it goes back to the dawn of humanity um fairy believers would say well look everyone sees them because they're there mm -hmm. there are lots of different ways to take this but it's a key key point yeah and and i mean I love the idea of fairies. I love the magic of fairies. And I love the stories that you guys keep sending me. And I hope you keep sending them to me so I can keep narrate, narrating them. <laughs> I've lost my ability to speak. And I hope that you will send your stories to Dr. Young at the Fairy Investigation Society and become uh -huh. part of the fairy census. Because I think that that's a really exciting opportunity. Um, and also join the Fairy Investigation Society. All the links for everything that we've talked about today are going to be in the description. All the books that we've mentioned, including Dr. Young's book. And can I, I want to. Can I just add one more thing that I regretted sure. not adding? Do we have. This is just 30 seconds. When we were talking, one of your, one of your listeners asked this very interesting question about the connection between aliens and fairies. And at the time, I was having problems remembering the title of the book. But this year, a very gifted young American, Joshua Cutchin, this is C U T C H I N, uh, brought out a book called Thieves in the Night, looking at the. Um, looking at the connection between aliens taking human beings and children and fairies taking human beings and children. And if, if your listener or if your listeners generally are interested, that's a book that's been out now for six months and it's a really interesting book. That sounds great. I'm, I'm going to put that one in the description too. Thank you for mentioning that. And thank you so much for joining us here on the channel and giving us your time and all of this fascinating information. I think that it's been really fun. Well, I, I really enjoyed it. I'm just so sorry about this cough, which has been plaguing me, but hopefully it didn't get in the way too much. Oh, I don't think that it did. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody who tuned in live and uh, we'll see you next time. And this has been a visit from your scary fairy. Godmother.